Hi, David. Thank you so much for joining us. It's my pleasure. Thank you. Um, I'm Peter Machen uh, for ProVerg, and we're talking to David Tillman today about biodiversity and the threats to biodiversity um, with World Biodiversity Day coming up. Um, David, I'm going to begin with two very simple questions. Um, the first is, um, although the issue of biodiversity is increasingly enter the, entering the mainstream, um, I suspect that a lot of people don't fully understand the concept or its broader implications. Uh, can you talk a little bit about what biodiversity is and why it's so important? Well, biodiversity refers to all the different kinds and forms of species there are on Earth. So all the different kinds of plants, of mammals, birds, and so on. And it's this importance has only been really thoroughly studied and discovered in the last two decades. We now know that the single most important factor determining how an ecosystem operates, how productive it is, how reliable and stable it is, and so on, is the number of different kinds of species living in it. Biodiversity turns about out to be the, the key to why the world functions in the ways that we need it to function for us to have good lives on Earth. Okay, that, that, that is very interesting, just the way you phrase it. Could, the, the same seems true about our bodies as well, which is also something we've only learned in the last 20 years, that the greater the biodiversity in our bodies, the healthier we are. Right, that's true. The whole microbiome, uh, that work on that, and the diversity of other organisms with us. There, I mean, there's a very simple reason why the world now has so many species. Each species was able to differentiate itself from what it was originally and become something new, a new species, because it did something better in that new form than any other species on Earth could do it. Each species is a specialist. It's like a profession. Each kind of doctor does a, has a different skill and is important in our, in our healthcare system. And each other profession in our economy does something unique that no other profession can do. Each species is a unique profession for life on Earth. If you lose a species, you lose that efficiency. Yeah, uh, that, that's kind of beautiful. Um, it relates very much to a question I'm going to ask you towards the end. Um, so now that we've established what biodiversity is um, and hopefully its implications, because, you know, that, that is key for me. Um, can we talk about uh, like some of the ways in which biodiversity is under threat around the world? Well, um, species have habitats they live in, that they're specialized in living in. And 40 percent of all the land on Earth has now been taken over by agriculture. So one species, humans feeding ourselves, have displaced whatever used to live on 40% of the land on Earth. And that is the single biggest threat to biodiversity is our food system. The more land that we need to feed ourselves, the more that we threaten the functioning of the ecosystems on Earth that we also need to provide us with lots of goods and services. Yeah. Does that is that forty percent including all pasturing, all arable land, all agricultural land, all planting, everything? It uh, includes uh, arable land uh, and pastures. It does not include, um, let's say, uh, monocultures of trees that we use to produce timber. That would add some more land to that that, that number. It doesn't include roads and cities and high and so on. So that's just, but that is the single largest use of land by people. And it's the use that is likely to expand greatly if we keep living the way we are living and having uh, diets that are unhealthy for the planet and unhealthy for us. Cool. So I'm, I, I, I'm going to um, cut short to another question that I wanted to ask, but I'm going to ask it now is, and, and this is very much the agenda under which we're operating in ProVeg, but like if we drastically reduced our meat consumption as a, you know, can just say hypothetically that we could all do it this year as a planet. You know, if we all say, if the entire middle class of the planet reduced their meat reduction by 50%, would that have like a huge impact? Absolutely. The amount of land we are likely to clear, destroy ecosystems to create new cropland and new pastures is huge around the world. And that would threaten almost all the remaining large mammals on Earth, for instance. 
uh, with extinction. And, and that is mainly driven by the greater consumption of meat that many people do when they become more wealthy. So the, the poorest countries in the world have their incomes going up right now. They're demanding more meat, more land is being cleared. And because of that, more and more species are getting closer and closer to extinction. So if we, if we could cut meat in half, if we could eat half the meat we eat right now, especially ruminants, especially beef, uh, that would have a huge long-term benefit uh, for our health and uh, for the health of all the ecosystems on Earth. Interestingly, what that would mean in most Western countries is simply that people eat what their government advises them to on their food plates or food permits. Because I think in most of the West, people eat twice what they're supposed to, you know, according to very conventional like measures. Yeah, there is um, uh, I, uh, what anybody for health would say, uh, great overconsumption of meat by most people. Most people imagine they need lots and lots of protein in their diet. In fact, you can get all the protein you need by having a, a grain-based diet without any meat at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in fact, um, so, so, so when people make the appeal to protein, you know, as, as being so important, it seems to me that the only time we really suffer protein deficiency is when we suffer malnutrition generally. Well, that's very true. you're not a medical doctor, but is that roughly true? Like, no, that is true. I'm not, I'm not a medical doctor, but I've collaborated with really excellent nutritionists. Uh, and in the 60s and 70s, nutritionists thought many people were ill, uh, malnourished for lack of protein. But an immense amount of research that was done then showed that wasn't the case. Now, red meat has a value, but the value is not for protein. It's that it has iron and vitamins in it uh, that are hard to get in other ways. So it, it turns out what people thought was a disease is caused by lack of protein was actually caused by lack of micronutrients and lack of vitamins. Just to clarify, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that biodiversity is threatened, um, say compared to the 1950s or the 1970s, I was born in 1971, and it's not just that we're beginning to lose biodiversity. It's we, like a huge amount has already been lost in, during my lifetime. Is that correct? That is correct. The um, if you look at the normal rates that species have gone extinct around the world, uh, for every million species, you lose about one species uh, in a year. Uh, and we are losing 20 to 40 times that amount right now. And that's a very conservative estimate based upon the real well-documented loss of species. But that's nothing compared to what will happen if we continue on our rapid land clearing trajectories around the world because we now have the countries with the greatest growth in population and the greatest growth in income living in the tropics. And those tropical countries are, are where the storehouse of global biodiversity is located. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm from South Africa and I think Cape Town actually has the most concentrated, in terms of plant life at least, um, the most concentrated source of biodiversity in the world. I don't know if that's true, but that's one of their claims. No, it's very true. The fame boss is amazing. Yeah. Um, and it's beautiful. I mean, you, you can kind of actually, like, when you go up there, you can smell it as a collective kind of thing. Um, yeah, it's really wonderful. Um, so, I mean, this is a big question, but it seems to me that systemic change on a global scale is needed not just in our diets, but in most areas of human activity if we are to address the core challenges of biodiversity. Um, is this true or is this an overstatement? No, it's very true. It, there are 8 billion of us and we demand uh, about 15 times more crop to be produced for each of us than we actually eat. Some of it we waste, much of it we give to livestock that eat it and then make milk and eggs and chicken and beef and pork and so on. And so we have an immense demand that way and we demand an immense amount of energy. And, and whenever 8 billion people demand something, there are global consequences. And the other thing is if you, you might think, well, 8 billion people is a problem, we have too many people. And that is a problem. But the even bigger problem is that we are richer, we demand more. The typical person right now has 60 times the buying power that we had in the year 1850. 
Each, each of us is, is demanding 60 times more goods and services from our economy. And, and we have to make sure each of these major items that we buy is being produced in a sustainable manner. Otherwise, we will just destroy the future of Earth as being a good place for humans to live. And let me tell you, there's no other planet we're ever going to live on. This is it. Yeah, 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 yeah. And I, I mean, it, it, it's, a, it's an old kind of T-shirt cliche, but even if there was, there's no other planet with chocolates and kittens. No, no this is, there's no other, there is no other place we'll ever make it. This is our only chance. Yeah, Mars doesn't float my boat anyway. Um, I mean, it looks beautiful. I'd like to go for a, you know, a day, but not forever. Um, and I do, just, you know, just, I, you know, there is, I'm kind of going on a tangent a little bit here. But I often, you know, read about, you know, people talking about, well, you know, the planet, you know, will just eject us and it will recover. Um, but I don't think it's that simple. Well, if you look at the long history of life on Earth, recovery, evolution of new species to make up for ones that went extinct after a mass extinction event, that's a 10 to a 30 million year process. And so it's, uh, it is ridiculous to imagine that everything will be all right in only 30 million years. I mean, we, we really have to do something now. Yeah, totally. I mean, it makes sense because we're here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and this planet is so beautiful. I mean, just on a personal level, like just the fact that koalas are functioning with, you know, are threatened with functional extinction. Giraffes. I mean, I just like, it's ludicrous. Like, it's just crazy. Like, Oh, I agree. It's, and you look at what people do. What do we do when we have time off? We go to nature. We go to national parks. Uh, we go to beaches. We, we, we swim and look at the, at the fish and so on. We look at birds. We love nature. We are a part of nature and it's been a part of our life forever. And yet when we live in cities and shop in grocery stores, we don't realize that uh, the foods, some of the foods we are buying are, are causing animals to go extinct and plants to go extinct all around the world. So um, some, something that I've been wondering for quite a while now, but just like, is, you know, if we collectively came to the realization that actually we are animals, that we, we are part of this, we are not separate. And then also, you know, and also that all of life is interconnected, you know, socially, politically, biolog biologically, do you think, like, for me, for me, that is the, sim the thing we need to realize, not just know, but realize and feel in order for, you know, like, for things to change. And it seems to me that, like, a fundamental shift in human perception is needed. Well, that would really help. I mean, we, we, we have traditions, laws, beliefs, um, cultural aspects that have been formed over hundreds of thousands of years. But almost all of those formed when we were having minor environmental impact, where what we did really didn't change the world. And that has only come about that, that, that we're having this kind of a large impact since around 1900. And it's been exploding. Uh, our impact has been exploding since then. And so it's very hard to realize how many things we need to change and how we need to change them. And especially you can't expect 8 billion people on earth to know what you and I know, Peter. We, we dedicate our lives to these kind of issues. They're just trying to live their life. And so we have to have some way that we uh, regulate our, our economy such that the goods and services uh, people want and need are being provided in a way that helps them, but also helps preserve the livability of earth. So, Right now, because your time is limited and because this is a kind of relatively short form, format um, you know, um, that we follow, uh, I just have two more questions, um, kind of obviously related to what we were talking about. My first is, what are key government actions that can be taken to mitigate or deal with the, bio the threat to biodiversity? There, it really depends upon the nation and its history. Some nations like the United States uh, have destroyed a large amount of its biodiversity and, and others were lost when people first spread across the continent and large uh, animals went extinct uh, 10,000 years ago. Uh, 
But at, but for the countries which are not as wealthy and have a, a future of a more rapid development, they could do an immense amount of good to preserve biodiversity by asking what kinds of ecosystems do they have? How could we save some? Where should we focus our development that we have to have to feed our people? On what lands and what lands can we save? Because it turns out the two biggest reasons why species are threatened with extinction, one is that land is cleared. And the other is that the uncleared land that is left is scattered about, little pieces here and there. If they were all left in one spot, sort of like a large national park, you could preserve an immense amount of biodiversity that you lose in all these little tiny pieces that we, we tend to leave behind when we develop land. So that could be a, that's a number one for a government, is to plan their land future, plan how they're going to let land be used and what land they're going to preserve. They have to do that now before that land is clear, because it'll never go back uh, to nature. Yeah. So that was, um, I, I think there's a relatively recent example of that that didn't work out very well. And um, I'm, I may be wrong about the details, but I'm pretty sure that it was Ecuador, like three or four years ago, asked the world to pay to pay it for not mining its, uh, its, its forests. I mean, I think part of the Amazon is in Ecuador. Um, and they wanted, they didn't want that much. I think they needed like $3 billion or something. And they didn't get like a cent. Well, that's uh, I don't know that story, but uh, but yet a lot of the conservation has gone on. For instance, in Costa Rica, which has an amazing uh, set of national parks uh, and that preserve lots of uh, tropical biodiversity, that was started because governments around the world were willing to forgive the debts of Costa Rica in exchange for Costa Rica saving land. It was an incredibly bargain, uh, a big bargain for the world that so much biodiversity was preserved at what was really was such a small cost. And we have to realize that we in wealthy countries have, maybe well, we are the original sinners. We've already done these things to the lands in our country. And that we would be hypocrites to imagine that poor developing nations should be able to do this all on their own without, without our assistance. Yeah. Uh so just some, some, something stuck out they said once the land's developed once the land is developed it's never going back um so, so um is real is rewilding a thing does it work if it's possible you know if it's politically feasible like is rewilding one of our solutions rewilding could help and i think uh, i'm sort of a radical in another way i think um, if we go to con continents like North and South America, which have lost all, almost all of their large uh, animals in a big extinction event 10,000 years ago, we, don't, we can't rewild them with the original species. But species have migrated from one continent to another many, many times over in the last 10 million years. And we could bring in species that are threatened, let's say, in uh, the southern part of Africa or in, uh, the, in, in South Asia, into comparable climates, comparable vegetation, not the species, but the basic form, and establish rewilded uh, high diversity uh, ecosystems uh, that would be one more um, piece of armor in our, in our desire to preserve this biodiversity forever. Yeah. So that's a wild, a wild radical thought, but I think we should do it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it's a great thought, and uh, I mean the idea of uh, like natural, you know, natural systems is so totally over in a way. Um, obviously, it would have to be done very carefully, and you know, by experts, because it could also go wrong. You know, yeah, it could. But it, it turns out, if you look at the at the history of movement of species from one continent to another, there's almost no case where even a large number of new species migrating into a, into a new continent ever caused the extinction of the existing species. They competed and they became rarer. The existing ones became rarer. That always happens, uh, but it never caused extinction. So it, um, that's, that is true for when new predators come in, when new herbivores, plant-eating animals come in and so on, and new plants come in. All those things have been re recorded over and over, over millions of years, and we see that. So I think there's reason to believe it's unlikely to be massively disastrous. Okay. So even when we introduce a disaster, it still doesn't lead to extinction, extinction, extinction level events. It just makes things messy for ourselves and... It, it, yeah, it, 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 there are new species we've invented which have been a pain. Often they're a, a problem because we introduce them without their natural enemies. 
Okay. Um, my very last question for you is, um, like, I almost don't want to ask it in case, the, the, like, in case, like, the answer is negative. But, like, can individuals make a difference? And, or, and oh. how can we make a difference? Well, absolutely. Uh, it, it, ultimately, what happens on Earth comes down to the choice that each of us make, choices that each of us make. And so when you're buying a new vehicle, try to uh, get one that has that gets the best efficiency for fuel. And now, if you can, maybe get one that is electric, which is, which is even a, a, big, a better thing to do. In our homes, a lot of energy is used in homes. In, uh, purchasing a replacement for a broken appliance that is highly efficient and how it uses energy is another very important thing to do. And then lastly, the main, one of the big things we consume that has a huge impact is food. So don't waste food and, and eat food that's lower down the food chain. Increase the uh, number of grains, whole grains, vegetables, uh, and fruits that you eat and eat less meat. You don't need as much meat. Almost no one needs as much meat as they're eating. And the grains that you substitute for it are healthier for you uh, and are much better for the environment. So basically, being efficient in our use of energy, being efficient in our use of food are the two things that each of us should do. And of course, those actions don't just benefit biodiversity, but they benefit, a whole, you know, obviously climate change and the planet and a whole range of other things. And they benefit your health. You live, uh, not just do you, you, do you live longer, but you live longer with less disease. Diseases like diabetes aren't just a problem because you have to take insulin and so on. They're a problem because they degrade the quality of your life. They, I mean, I, my grandmother died of diabetes. I saw she went blind. She, you, know, you can start having trouble of blood flow to feet and so on and have to have parts of you. Amp it's really a horrible disease. And we can avoid it. It's a totally avoidable disease. With the right diet uh, and exercise, none of us have to get type 2 diabetes. Uh, and so I, I think that there is a, a massive win-win that people aren't thinking about. Yeah. Um, well, that is a wonderful way to end, end, end our conversation. Thank you so much for talking to me, David. It's been a pleasure, Peter. Okay, thank you very much.